In the second half of the 20th century, North and South Vietnam became a Cold War battleground. The South Vietnamese challenged the spread of communism into their republic. The United States saw the Republic of Vietnam as a domino that would fall should the growing communist insurgency go unchecked. The South Vietnamese required a robust internal defense. America needed to train the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. America's involvement in Vietnam offers a lens into understanding foreign internal defense, better known as FID. This joint doctrine requires the close coordination of civilian and military agencies of one government to assist another government with its security. Together, they protect a society from subversion, lawlessness, insurgency, terrorism, and other threats. In U.S. Army doctrine, there are three types of FID. These are indirect support, direct support, non-combat, and combat operations. Today, conventional forces play a significant role in FID, as they did in South Vietnam. Conventional forces conduct and support FID operations across the warfighting functions and range of military operations, from indirect support to combat authorization. FID assistance helps the host nation garner stability, which is achievable by anticipating and countering internal threats. To accomplish all these actions, U.S. forces must assess the quality of a foreign security force and the operational environment to properly determine training strategies and mission essential tasks. The actions taken while conducting FID include organizing, training, equipping, building or rebuilding infrastructure, and advising foreign security forces. Units and individual soldiers, regardless of MOS, help the host nation's security force in common soldier tasks, the professional warrior ethos, and often human rights. All forces, whether special operations or conventional, contribute to building partner capacity through the sharing of their technical and tactical proficiency specific to their MOS with their counterparts. The Army recently created Security Force Assistance Brigades, or SFABs, for the first time to do the advisory mission. The Vietnam experience offers soldiers in those units clear parallels to consider in how they will operate as advisors themselves. Today's FIT doctrinal principles apply to the U.S. training of Arvin, as South Vietnam faced internal and external threats. Recent decades, there's been some parallels between what the United States has been doing overseas and what it did in Vietnam in the 1960s. The Foreign Internal Defense Program, or FID, uh, is an effort to do what we did essentially in Vietnam, which is to help host nations develop their institutions to defend themselves and become kind of autonomous, prosperous societies which will help us in whatever fight it might be. So FID really deals with training their host, the host nation security forces, right, so that they can defend their own nation. And the indirect uh, kind of uh, support for that is kind of in intelligence cooperation, logistic support, uh, and kind of civic action kind of programs to help them develop their own political and economic institutions. The roots of the insurgency predated the Republic of Vietnam. During the Second World War, Ho Chi Minh led the Viet Minh, the communist Vietnamese who envisioned an independent state, in the fight against the occupying Imperial Japanese. Once the Allied powers defeated Imperial Japan, France tried to re-exert its control over its colonies in Indochina. The First Indochina War then raged between the French and the Viet Minh. The United States backed France in its efforts to combat the Viet Minh in their goal of establishing a communist Vietnam. All right, so by 1949, the First Indochina War uh, is essentially stalemated uh, in Vietnam. Uh, Viet Minh uh, and Ho Chi Minh, the communists, they are strong in the countryside. The French are strong in kind of the urban areas as well. Meanwhile, back in France, the war has become increasingly unpopular among the French population or segments of the French population. France established the state of Vietnam in 1949 to challenge the Viet Minh claims to sovereignty. Although the Vietnamese served in French colonial units, they did so in relatively small numbers. 
Under U.S. pressure to improve military capabilities, French authorities created the Vietnamese National Army, or the VNA, in 1950. Over the next few years, the war became an ever-worsening quagmire for the French, culminating in their defeat at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. The French resolved to hold on to their colony ended. They began to withdraw after signing the Geneva Accords. Training the VNA remained a short-term, post-accord obligation for Paris. Together, French and American soldiers trained Vietnamese recruits under TRIM, or Training Relations and Instruction Mission. By April 1956, the French had completely withdrawn from Vietnam. The Geneva Accord mandated elections occur in July of 1956. The Eisenhower administration never pushed for elections because they perceived Ho Chi Minh as more popular than their hand-picked man, Nguyen Jin Diem. The Americans did not want to risk Diem losing the election and their foothold in the region. The state of Vietnam then dissolved into the Communist Democratic Republic of Vietnam, North Vietnam, and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, South Vietnam. With that split came two ideologically opposed states, each intent on unification, but under their own banner. The American advisory effort increased in the new Republic of Vietnam. A new nation meant a new military. Under the Republic of Vietnam military forces, the VNA successor, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or ARVIN, grew under the American advisory effort. Between 1950 and 1964, American advisors in South Vietnam served under the Military Assistance and Advisory Group Vietnam, or MAGV. Most early MAGV advisors found themselves in South Vietnam without Vietnamese language training. Language training eventually improved, but that did not remedy a fundamental problem. Each advisor had a finite amount of time to overcome cultural differences, build rapport with their counterparts, and impart knowledge and training needed to develop Arvin into a well-organized fighting force. U.S. advisors ostensibly served as observers. As armed conflict between North and South re-emerged, they found themselves playing a far more active role in providing their expertise on equipment and tactics, as well as engaging in combat. The U.S. Army's policy of rotating advisors undercut the enduring effects individual advisors had on a unit. Meanwhile, Arvin's war continued, unabated. Arvin units, and even individual soldiers, reflected American influences. MAGV recognized Arvin's previous combat experience against the Unconventional People's Liberation Armed Forces, or PLAF. Training Arvin on counter-guerrilla warfare remained an early priority for American advisors. Air mobility and firepower, hallmarks of the 1960s Army, were adopted by the Arvin. American advisors trained South Vietnamese to depend upon well-integrated fires. Unfortunately, the heavy reliance on artillery required a larger logistical train and forced Arvin to move on roads. It therefore functioned like a traditional Western conventional force. Recent experience fighting conventional threats in Korea had left a lasting impression on American advisors who, now in South Vietnam, implemented a force structure designed to take on both conventional and unconventional enemies. That's where major emphasis uh, was put, in a process that's often referred to as mirror imaging. Uh, we've done that many times. We did that with the Republic of uh, Korea forces. Uh, we did it subsequently in places as Iraq and Afghanistan, where we uh, trained them and equipped them in a mirror image of how the United States fought as well, too. The training uh, that was involved under MAGV, uh, essentially you can divide it down into two parts. Uh, one part was we were helping uh, the Republic of Vietnam developed their own 
uh, conventional armed forces, if you will, to protect the nation, their own self-defense forces. And that was a major, probably the largest emphasis of MAGV, was to help South Vietnam train these conventional forces for national self-defense. There was also another element of that as well, too, uh, which was a program known as the Civilian Irregular Defense Group, or CIDG. And that is where uh, small contingents of special forces, Green Berets, if you will, would train minorities uh, in South Vietnam's western mountainous regions, known as Montagnards. Special forces have a role to play in FID. American advisors trained Montagnards to take the war to the communists on behalf of the Saigon government. It was really important because Saigon had a minimal footprint out in these remote areas and the communists were trying to make inroads here. So by working with, with the local forces, the United States was able to get Saigon a means to combat the growing communist infiltration. This benefited everyone, the United States, the Saigon government, and the Montagnards. The United States, in training Arvin in this mirror image to, f to be organized and to fight with the, the equipment and the doctrine that the U.S. uses, that was problematic for these forces as well, too, uh, where it's just, it takes a long time uh, to become proficient in, in logistics or technical support. So that's another reason that Arvin uh, had some deficiencies. It's just we were expecting them to, to not only grow so large in the short amount of time, to become really technically proficient in a Western style of warfare, heavily dependent on technology and firepower in a very short amount of time as well, too. And that was problematic over the long haul. The American advisors worked with the South Vietnamese to establish military schools and training centers that mirrored U.S. models. Basic training was conducted at Quang Trung, a facility that closely resembled those found in the U.S. De La Military Academy was essentially South Vietnam's West Point. Senior officers attended the Army War College equivalent in Saigon. The Two Duke School Center served Arvin's artillery, engineer ordnance, and quartermaster branches. The Nha Trang Command School trained South Vietnamese soldiers to become rangers for Arvin. Professional military education continued in the United States for select Arvin officers. For example, 236 Arvin officers attended the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Saigon's politics jeopardized Arvin's abilities in the field. Always wary of losing power, Nho Jing Diem used Arvin early on to fight rivals and later as protection against coups. To that end, he interfered in unit deployments and officer appointments. Meddling also came in the form of corruption, as Arvin Corps commanders sold assignments. Some Arvin units suffered from personnel shortages by being forced to keep ghost billets so opportunistic officers could collect extra pay. Arvin is very political. It is used by Nyo Dien Dim to go after his opponents. He holds on to the units that he considers the most elite to protect him. He meddles in uh, command decisions. He, medd he meddles in officer appointments. Uh, it is not necessarily a system where you get promoted based upon how good of a soldier you are, but maybe more so based upon how loyal you are to him. Uh, and that creates a lot of problems because the generals, the officers, are thinking not only in terms of who are they fighting on the battlefield, but also who are they fighting politically. Corruption was also a major problem among the officer class. And this was also something uh, that was very off-putting uh, for uh, American advisors who saw this as a major problem. One also uh, example I may say to you honestly, like General T, you remember here, he was command of the I Corps. Mm -hmm. He's a very good man in military, fighting, good, rough man, but his background is not too good background. So the people are very easy to manipulate him and yeah. very exciting him very to good. let him believe that very true and let him believe he's very high and very important one to just go ahead. You know, many people ask me, how you may survive about yes. that? I said, 
only you know. I do not inform with any military, uh, many, any political people. I keep away from them. Mm. In early 1962, the U.S. established a second military command in the Republic of Vietnam. Designated as Military Assistance Command Vietnam, or MACV, this new organization represented an increase in American material assistance and combat support. With American aid, the Saigon government sought to improve security across the country. The Strategic Hamlet Program, where the South Vietnamese government forcibly relocated entire communities to more secure areas, served as a cornerstone to this nationwide effort. At the same time, Arvin's focus on counterinsurgency showed some positive results. Operations across the country to secure these populations sought to give Saigon the strategic initiative. Operation Sea Swallow is one of many operations conducted in 1962 to make the countryside more secure in the Republic of Vietnam. This one in particular is conducted in the province of Phu Yen, uh, the, again, these operations are being mounted to push out the communist influence so that the government in Saigon can make the population safer because they're going to create distance between the insurgents, the guerrillas, if you will, and the people. And so that's really important to separate the two. Um, but again, there's many of these operations happening. And Sea Swallow is just one of them. There's this much larger campaign. Um, for the U.S. advisors, what's important is that these look successful. Arvin is doing a good job at it. In 1962, it looks like Arvin is doing a great, well, you could say a great job, you could say a good job, but it's learning from each of these operations, and it's on the offensive. The tempo of war is with Arvin. Operation Sea Swallow and similar operations in 1962 are being conducted by conventional forces, and that's really important. Conventional warfare is a big component of this. But more importantly, at the strategic level, the initiative rests with Arvin. Operation Sea Swallow seemed to demonstrate that Arvin had the initiative. South Vietnamese forces, too, showed they can conduct operations to achieve political goals. For American advisors, the operation gave the appearance that Arvin could fight the war, but the Battle of Ap Bak was a turning point. For the first time during the war, well-prepared PLAF battalions stood their ground when engaged by air mobile and mechanized Arvin units. At Ap Bak, we have Arvin defeated by a much smaller set of PLAF. It's something that should probably have never have happened because of poor U.S. intelligence. And it was looked at as a kind of test of our advisory effort and Arvin writ large. The Battle of Ap Bak left 86 Arvin dead, with another 108 wounded. Three Americans died during the battle. Pilots accounted for two of the fatalities. And MAGV advisor U.S. Army Captain Kenneth Newland Good died trying to rally and lead Arvin soldiers. Despite being trained and equipped to fight as Americans, Arvin was comprised of Vietnamese soldiers who were culturally and philosophically different from their American counterparts. Arvin is sometimes considered Vietnam's forgotten army. And that's largely because it is totally written off as something that didn't fight hard or didn't fight well. Um, and that pretty much starts at Ap Bak. That one disaster casts a very dark shadow on its performance going forward. When U.S. advisors would look at this force, um, it would be a mixed bag, but the negative view uh, persisted for so long. Um, but there was a lot of um, estrangement, if you will. Part of the problem is that the United States and Vietnam are, are, are very culturally different societies, um, and the, based upon the differences in culture, there were differences in expectation. Arvin has been, for a long time, they were one of the most vilified kind of militaries in, in, in modern history. Um, they were looked at as incompetent, as kind of cowardly, as not up to snuff with their uh, communist counterparts, if you will. Um, and a lot of that comes from um, American military advisors. 
Lieutenant Colonel John Paul Van, lead U.S. advisor in Three Corps, witnessed the Battle of Atbach from above. Speaking to American reporters following the battle, a frustrated Van accused Arvin officers of incompetence. Away from the battlefield, General Paul D. Harkins, the MACV commander, disagreed. He considered the battle a success since Plaff ultimately abandoned Atbach and the Arvin took control of the territory. Similarly, Nyo Jing Diem and his government refused to see Atbach as a defeat. For them, Arvin's prior gains against the NLF overshadowed any shortcomings exposed during the battle. Nevertheless, the strategic initiative had shifted to the communists. And it was obviously because it was a defeat for the Arvin force, uh, it was not looked on very well. Uh, several American journalists covering it, um, you know, they, they portrayed Arvin in a very poor light. Um, it gets overblown in the U.S. media. Uh, Arvin, again, doesn't get a chance to defend itself in the U.S. media. Uh, and that's something that's going to haunt the, the war going forward because it's seen as a turning point. And that's quite unfortunate uh, because where Arvin was doing really well before, we get one battle that pretty much decides what happens after. Atbach was a, a disaster for Arvin simply because they were poorly led. Uh, some bad decisions were made uh, by commanders who were reluctant to lose forces. Again, the idea of losing face was very important to Arvin officers, and oftentimes they would be reluctant to commit forces for losing those forces as well, too. Uh, Ziem, for his part, was reluctant to release certain units, particularly his ranger units, his more skilled fighters, again, because for fear of a coup uh, or an assault on the palace, challenge to his authority, he would hold those skilled forces in reserve rather than use them. They understood that they had strengths as well as weaknesses, but there was a lot of a frustration based upon uh, certain issues, whether it was uh, poor leadership, and this is one of the major kind of tropes that you see come out in the history books when historians discuss Arvin, is the idea that uh, the leadership simply was not there. Although Arvin appeared to be on the right path before Atbach, the ramifications of that disastrous battle changed the very nature of FID in the Republic of Vietnam. In November 1963, Arvin officers assassinated Nguyen Jin Diem. Political turmoil in Saigon followed as a carousel of weak generals attempted to rule South Vietnam. For Arvin, this political instability severely undermined operations against the communists and contributed to a worsening security across the country. Communist activity dramatically increased in the face of Saigon's disorder. And the PLAF became more emboldened as conventional forces and equipment arrived from North Vietnam. These new forces directly contributed to overrunning the strategic hamlets and hemming in Saigon's footprint in the provinces. Instead of looking like a force capable of achieving the objectives envisioned by its American advisors, Arvin looked increasingly more like the unprepared force defeated at Atbach. If you look writ large, uh, it was kind of a mixed bag, and, and, and many individuals will tell you that. Arvin had some, a lot of strengths, but they also had a lot of weaknesses as well. They fought, and they, they, they fought hard, right? And one of the reasons why South Vietnam stayed a state for, for, for as long as it did, right? Not a, a long history, right? About... 20 years, but still, one of the reasons why they existed for so long was that Arvin was able to, to, to kind of maintain the state, right, as the, one of the, the, the kind of powerful institution within the Republic of Vietnam. Um, it, it fought and it was able to kind of preserve that independence for, for 20, 20 some odd years. What we often forget is that it did fight for the entire existence of the Republic of Vietnam. It was trained by the United States to fight the way it fought. It did fight like the U.S. Army in large part, and it absolutely fought to the bitter end. But still, there was enough problems for, uh, uh, you know, the Arvin and its checkered kind of uh, uh, 
combat uh, efficacy, right, which was very off-putting and frustrating for American advisors. Uh, you gotta remember how they, how they grew over time, and this is another thing. This is a, a young state which is essentially know nothing but war throughout its entire history. So there are a lot of parallels between what's been going on for the last 20 years uh, and what happened in Vietnam. I mean, nation building was the name of the game in both Iraq and Afghanistan, um, in which we're trying to help host nation security forces, those friendly to the United States or allied to the United States, be able to become competent enough to defend themselves, and then kind of economic and political reforms that they'll develop political institutions, democratic institutions that would, you know, allow them to side with the West against uh, terrorist organizations. By 1964, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam appeared incapable of fighting on its own. Following the Gulf of Tonkin crisis, the American reaction to Arvin's setbacks was to expand U.S. combat power in the Republic of Vietnam. In turn, this ever-increasing buildup resulted in the absorption of MAG-V into MAC-V. After the PLAF raid on the U.S. base at Pleiku in 1965, American strategy shifted to giving Arvin more time to mature, while U.S. combat forces went on the offensive. Advising continued, even as Arvin remained in the fight. Chúng tôi xin tạm biệt và chân thành gửi đến quý vị lời biết ơn của toàn thể nghệ sĩ đã góp phần tạo nên cuốn băng này.